Okay. Uh, it's good to see everybody again. Uh, last week, we, we tackled Titus chapter one. Our goal was to get all the way through Titus chapter one. And so we got through the first four uh, uh, verses, which is not particularly shocking in a class that I'm, I'm involved in. We never seem to make it very far. Uh, but this week, we're going to start with uh, verse number five. Uh, it seems particularly appropriate, given the fact that we're talking about uh, elders in Titus chapter one, verse five. And given what we're about to be doing in our church and what we are currently doing in our church, it seems like a good refresher course uh, to have a discussion on these issues and and put them back into uh, the forefront of our minds as we're, we're getting ready to go into the elder selection process. Uh, we did read all of chapter one last week, but Johnny, uh, I'm going to ask that you you go ahead and read Titus chapter one, verses five through nine, so that we can kind of uh, get everybody's mind in the right spot again, if you don't mind doing that for us. No problem, sir. For this reason, I left you in Crete that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. If a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of dissipation or insubordination. For a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but hospitable, a lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled, holding fast, the faithful word as he has been taught, that he be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. Out of curiosity, Johnny, what version were you reading out of? Uh, sir, I have one that's been my favorite for a good while. It's called the American Patriots Bible that I like a great deal. It was a different translation than what I'd heard. and There was nothing that I had an issue with. I was just kind of curious because there was some words that were used there that were a little different. I, give everybody context. You know, when we started reading about Titus, Titus was uh, a close friend to Paul and, and uh, was often with him in his travels. He was a Gentile. Uh, he had accompanied Paul to Jerusalem when they were first addressing the Judaizer issue. And uh, he had been given tasks in the past by Paul. And he was an important right-hand man to Paul's ministry. And when he's here on the island of Crete, Paul has given him uh, a specific uh, direction in helping the, the fledgling churches there in Crete uh, to begin their maturation process and to establish, you know, the next generation of the church. And one of the very first things that he wants addressed is to establish uh, the, the uh, institution of elders at the various churches. And the primary reason that is provided in the context of Titus is to address false teachers, to address the Judaizers. That was, you know, the, the preeminent reason being provided for uh, moving forward with this, uh, with this, uh, the institution of elders. If you go to Acts chapter 20, a very similar argument, uh, you know, uh, a very similar admonishment was given to the elders there to watch out for the wolves, the false teachers that would come among them. So this is a recurring theme. This is something that you're going to see quite often uh, in regards to uh, uh, why the purpose behind elders. So with that context in mind, let's kind of look at these, uh, let's kind of look at, at what's being established here. You know, last week as we talked uh, I talked about how, you know, today this is a hot button issue. You know, we we you hear some people use the word qualifications of elders. You have other people use the words characteristics that elders might have. Uh, other people will uh, take it to, uh, you know, guidance uh, and, and kind of like a a mosaic or a portrait of elders uh, when you look at these qualifications. Uh, or look at these uh, traits, characteristics, whatever word you want to use. Why is it? Why is it that today this is 
there's so much quibbling, there's so much discussion over whether or not these are characteristics or if they're, you know, hard line qualifications. Why is there so much discussion on that issue? Anybody want to hazard a guess? It probably wouldn't be a guess for most of you. I mean, I, the, obvious, the obvious reason is elders are so important, right? It's, it's, I mean, they are the leaders of our local church. And in that position, uh, there's, there's obviously a need to have people filling those positions. And I think in our, in our society, as we've, uh, as, as we've developed into our modern kind of perspective, our modern sensibilities, we tend to believe that we all uh, fall short. We all have our, our, our weaknesses. Uh, we are a society that is engaged more in criticism than we are in encouragement. Uh, and I think as we look at these uh, characteristics, we tend to be concerned that no man is going to meet these characteristics. Uh, there's nobody that's going to have all these attributes. There's nobody that's going to have, you know, that whole list. It, it sounds like, you know, it sounds like Jesus Christ. You know, it sounds like this, this amazing uh, person uh, that cannot be assailed on any, on any grounds. And so I think there is a, a desire to uh, find a balance there so that we're not uh, a, rudder, a rudderless ship as we discussed last week and we have people who are filling these leadership positions how do you guys feel about that aspect i mean does it uh if we are to diminish our expectations if we are to reduce our expectations in who fills the eldership role what would be your your concern in that what would be the danger in that i was thinking Jason, I was thinking that, uh, you know, as in, in this case, Paul is asking Titus to appoint elders. So Titus is coming in from kind of an outside role. He, he knows the people. He knows the reputations. But he's looking at the total picture where if you were to, I, I don't think in my mind that we really want elders who are not struggling a little bit with these qualifications, as you say, where they, I, I'd like to see a little humility there that they would say, I'm not quite that person. But if you're Titus looking into it, you see the full picture. Or if you're asking the church to look at the people from their viewpoint, they're seeing the full picture. But if you ask the individual, they're probably going to say, um, I, I can see where I'm falling down on, on this right here. And if this is a qualification rather than a quality, then I don't, I don't meet that qualification. That's just a self-judgment that each person is asked to, to do. But if they don't approach that with some humility, then I don't really think they're the ones that we want in that role. Yeah, I think it, I think it's easy for us to look at these qualities and uh, view such a person that they might be uh, above us in some way. You know, they might not be relatable. They might not be somebody you feel like you can go talk to. Uh, for guidance. It may be somebody that feels uh, removed from the same things that I, as a regular Christian, I'm struggling with. Uh, and uh, that, that's obviously a concern. I think though, like you said, I think that a person that has these qualities at the same time is going to recognize their own short, you know, they're going to be uh, mindful of how they fall short, right? And it's going to be something that uh, they readily relate to, uh, despite maybe having these qualities all in some measure 
you know, either in great amounts or in lesser amounts. Uh, Johnny, you uh, were you starting to say something a second well, ago? I, I was just going to point out the idea of elders, a plural, suggests that that uh, a balance of people that possess most, but not necessarily all of these in equal quantity, become a much more stronger uh, group of people as leaders. Because you know the idea of fear and trembling and and the and the speck in your, your your brother's eye and the plank in yours, all of those things come to mind when you start considering these things uh, in terms of any kind of respectful or humble self uh, uh, reflection. I think anybody that, that said, man, I got all this in spades is probably dangerous. Not, not, not worthy of honor, but worthy of caution. Yeah, I think we, I'm sorry, yes, Am I, go ahead. No, I was gonna say, Paul, go ahead. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, I think, I think also, you know, as Americans, we, we tend to, think about things from a political standpoint as well. But when I read this, this, uh, you know, absolutely. Is everybody 100% these things all the time? No, nope. not gonna, it's not gonna happen. But you know what, what the scripture tells us and then Paul in Galatians really lays it out well. You know, when, when you have accepted Jesus Christ as your savior and you've allowed spirit to enter your life and you start becoming a spiritual person in other words you're you are aligned with god that's what spirituality is is being aligned with what god wants you to be doing you're going to change you're going to be a different person and i think what uh i, I think jason you said a few minutes ago that and terry did too that here titus is coming in and you, you know he is um uh, what's the right what's the right word he, he has no conflict of interest. Right. He's going into their, their towns, their churches, and he doesn't have any of these petty rivalries to, to worry about, right? He's just coming in and kind of looking at, what is Jason? You know, he's, he seems to be someone whose life has changed because look at the rest of the Cretan. And Paul mentions that later in the chapter. Look at, look at where most Cretans come from. Now look at this guy. He's he actually likes people. He actually is a changed person, and these are some of the changes you look at, and they line up pretty well with the fruits of the spirit that you see in Galatians. So it's it's just the spirit working in the, in, in their life, and uh, I think the congregation's challenge when elder selection time comes around is to kind of put rivalries aside and and things like that and just look at you know who is who is really you know you know leaning in those directions they're not perfect everybody knows that but you know and plus then you can't then you can't say well you know you're supposed to be perfect uh, well i wasn't yesterday but now i'm i'm ordained as an elder so now i'm perfect and now i can be ridiculed for not meeting your standard uh, that's what, you know, the, but my joke is, and it's not really a joke, it's a sad reality because I've, I've been there a couple times now is uh, the honeymoon is over before you even get your plate at the celebratory uh, covered dish dinner on ordination day. That's just the truth of it. It's the sad truth of it. And so, you know, I, I, I think it's kind of neat that, that Titus gets to come in and work through things without having any conflict of interest, any bias at all, and uh, is looking at hearts. Yeah, it definitely gives him a freedom that maybe uh, we don't always have because he is he is coming from a, a place of neutrality uh, as he approaches the, the issue. You know, one of my issues with treating this as a bright line qualification type situation is the list of qualifications in first Timothy and the list in Titus are not identical. Uh, there's additional uh, qualifications that are set out in Titus that may not occur, that do not occur in first Timothy. And that suggests to me that this is not meant to be a an exhaustive analysis of, of the traits and characteristics of, a, of an elder. At the same time, when I read through 
the verses, uh, you know, the imperative is used. You know, it says an elder must. Uh, and, and so I, I'm at the same time that I'm, I'm uh, leery of, of using this as a bright line. I'm also leery of just dismissing these, these attributes, these, these qualities, because uh, I think elders are, get, are, are given a very difficult task. I, I believe elders are, are given a lot of responsibility. And they're held to standards that people who are not in that office are not held to. And as a result, I do think that elders are of a special quality. Uh, they need to be of a special quality to be able to do the things uh, that are asked of them. But to speak to one of the points that, that uh, uh, Paul brought up, you know, so many people use these qualities kind of as a sword. Uh, to, to try to hurt people, you know, to try to diminish people. Uh, they try to use these as, as ways to uh, capitalize on their rivalries or their, their personal vendettas. And they, they use it as, as something that uh, hurts the person that's being considered as opposed to, uh, I think it should be treated, th these qualities, these, these uh, characteristics they're provided to us in an effort to shield the church, you know? So, you know, contrast that with the idea that people use them as a sword. I think that the purpose of these attributes is to uh, identify men who are of a quality that they can be that shield for the church uh, and, and try to protect them from uh the issues that are being discussed, you know, the, the Judaizers, the, the legalists, the, uh, the false teachers that are inside a church or false doctrines that may take hold in a church. Um, and so I, again, I'm reluctant to diminish them too much because I do think the, the portrait that is drawn here of an elder is, is of the exceptional, the, the one that is above uh, just your run of the mill Christian. These are mature Christians who have reached a certain point in their journey. Uh, so they're not susceptible to some of the same tossing to and fro that you might see from, from an immature Christian. Uh, so that's, that's a, something that I want to make pretty clear, at least from my perspective, as I, as I look at it. Uh, you know, Jason, I wanted to point out that this, this civilization this was written, as you mentioned, last, last Sunday, I mean, last uh, when, uh, time you did this, around 60, 63 AD, we don't know, but it was, it was pretty, pretty young in the AD numbers. But this civilization had been around since uh, at least 1400 and maybe as, as late, as early as 2700. And they had like 15 names for, the, for their country. They couldn't even agree on what to call their country. So th this group had a, an entire history of, of uh, in, of, of disagreement because it was such a diverse culture. They were not a, a monoculture group at all. And actually Tiberius took all of his dissenters that didn't agree with him and stuck them over there and, and created as one of their uh, 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 places. So this thing was a hodgepodge of, of disagreements. I mean, they, they couldn't even agree to disagree, you know? And, and so I'll take that Aggie perspective and go one further. When you're dealing with your brothers and sisters, when you're dealing literally with your siblings and somebody says to you, you know, I've got a sister and they go, she is a great woman. And the reality is objectively, she's a great woman, but but they're not the ones who, who got bit in the back by her when she was an unhappy four-year-old. And I still got a scar in the middle of my back from my little sister. So we get too close to each other and we can see some faults that other people can't. So this bringing in this veteran who was at, at Corinth for, uh, for Paul, Titus, he, uh, he can see it in a little bit better perspective. And, and he gave a standard, not an absolute. Yeah, and, and, and I think you're right. You know, the, the question always becomes, it says not given to much drunkenness or, you know, or not, not pursuing dishonest gain. <laughs> what level of drunkenness is okay? What level of, you know, where does it, where does that, you know, where does that framework change over, you know? And I, I think, when I look through this list, the way I have applied it practically is when I look at candidates, I go, do they have 
one of these things that they are glaringly missing? You know, do they have something that is obviously an issue with them that fits inside these things? And if it's to me, if it's close, then it's not an issue. It, it's, it's when it's obvious that they are lacking one of these things. That's where it becomes an issue. And so, like I said, I, there have been times in my life where I have used it as a kind of as a, a what was it that Jesus said, a winnowing fork? You know, it, I, I, I was using it to eliminate people instead of using it to identify people. And, and I think there is something to be said for having that attitude as you approach this issue. You know, are you looking to, to winnow out everybody or are you looking to find people uh, that can feel those, those qualities and, 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 you know, lead the church in the direction that it needs to go? Um, the other thing, I, what is the, if we're just to throw out, if we were to throw out these, these characteristics and we were to throw out these traits and instead say, you know what, uh, we can choose the best people. We can choose the people to lead the church. And, and we don't need to look at any, for any guidance from, from this list. What is the risk? What is the danger that will, will, will happen in those situations? What kind of people will we end up having uh, as our leaders, probably. Anybody want to hazard what I'm thinking? Or maybe what you're thinking. I don't care. Well, you get into the world of politics and, and <clears throat> you know, deceit is, is the name of the game. And, and uh, unfortunately, in, in uh, my career, I had to deal with a lot of politicians and at different junctures. And I, I never was very crazy about any of them. In fact, I used to, you know, I couldn't wash my hands fast enough after shaking their hand in some cases. And so you get into things where folks are, are, are playing games and, and things like that. And, and you look, look at this about being above reproach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, when we went off camera last week, uh, we we're having kind of the after the class class, I told a story about a about a preacher I heard on a podcast recently that uh, when he was a young preacher, uh, he made the mistake of asking, he's going to preach this man's funeral, and he made the mistake of, of asking the family about this man's walk with Christ. So they told him all this stuff. And so he gets up there, and he's just preaching away, and he notices that the audience is kind of fidgeting around like, they're kind of looking to see who's in that casket up there. They're looking at the program. Well, yeah, that's that's him, but that's not who he's talking about. Uh, you get into those situations where there's 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 somewhere that they look like this here, but in the in the real world, there's something else altogether. Uh, so that winnowing fork that you mentioned a minute ago, uh, Jason, is is a good analogy, I think. Because this is kind of a winnowing fork of, you know, get to know these folks. If you don't, you know, I've, I've been in churches where, uh, you know, this, this thing comes up and you're new in town. You don't know anything. So you, you're, you're, you're neutral. You don't even participate because you don't know them. Uh, but you're kind of like Titus, you're kind of an outsider and you're, and you're looking, you're saying, Really? Okay, you know, there's not much you can do about it. It's going to happen anyway, but sometimes the results are, are less than good. Yeah, you know, a, a couple of things I want to say in relationship to that. You know, I, I tend to believe that uh, if, if, we, if we remove what God sets out in, in 1 Timothy or in Titus, we will end up with the most charismatic. We will end up with the uh, most uh, successful, you know, from a worldly perspective. Uh, we will tend towards uh, uh, maybe the most pretty, you know, the, 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 the ones that uh, uh, attract us, you know, uh, and, 
And that's not necessarily the qualities of a Christian leader, right? I mean, it's not, it's not the one who's silver tongue necessarily who, who is doing, and look, let me say this, just because you're a good speaker doesn't mean you're, 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 you shouldn't be considered. What I'm saying is though, that isn't, that isn't the characteristic you're looking for. You're looking for someone who can defend the faith, somebody who can uh, defend the, the church from those that are outside. And that may be somebody who occasionally offends or, or, or takes it. You know, one of my, one of my biggest frustrations in life uh, right now in the political world is if you take a stand on an issue, immediately people start to tear you down. It's, it's the people who never, you're never quite sure where they stand on something that seem to advance the furthest, you know? And um, I admire people who are willing to take a stand and then defend it. Uh, and I think that's the kind of person that they're looking for in elders, you know, is somebody who, who stands for something and is able to defend what they stand for. Um, and the problem with those people is sometimes they offend. And if you're offended by somebody, lots of times you don't want, you know, you're going to find excuses. You know, we're again going to turn these qualities into swords to take those people out. And, and I just, I think we need to be careful in, in doing that. Uh, uh, I think we need to avoid uh, voting for the, the movie star or the, the politician or the, uh, you know, the person that has the qualities that the world may push up at the highest, or we may naturally just because we are creatures of, of our upbringing, gravitate towards and instead focus on the people that have the attributes, have these qualities uh, that's being put out there. And that was kind of my, you know, kind of my point in this is, uh, it's not always the obvious person that that has these qualities. Second thing I wanted to say is this. You guys, uh, a couple of you have mentioned already that, you know, Titus was an outsider on some level to these people. He wasn't a, a resident there. So when he's the one picking the elders, when he's the one deciding who has these attributes, it's obvious it's not something it, it, it appears to be some, the people who have these qualities, the people who should be elders are something that a stranger can figure out. Somebody who's on the outside can figure out. And um, sometimes it, it, it I, I don't think we should compromise that process. We shouldn't compromise the selection of the elders for numbers or for uh, uh, filling the positions. Because I do think it, it, it is somewhat obvious who those people are uh, that should be elders. Now, I'm not saying it's going to be consensus. It's going to be unanimous. None of those things. Believe me, having been part of the elder selection process in the past, the, the numbers uh, that people get the first time through the process, it's not a huge number because everybody's kind of got their own ideas of what it is. But it still is something that should be, it should be something that's readily available to us when we sit down and think about the people who are in our church, who should be elders. It, they should be identifiable to us. We should be able to recognize them. I mean, Titus was doing it as an outsider coming into a community in a relatively short time because he was visiting multiple churches. You get the impression he's not like based in one spot. He's, he's moving around. He's itinerant. So he's able to make these selections, see these people uh, in a relatively short time. Paul, or are you just leaning forward? No, 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 no. Yes. You're, I think, that's exactly right. And also the churches are smaller. You know, they're not hundreds of people. They're, they're 10 or 20 or 30, you know, it's, it's not huge. And so, yeah, I think that the person that is <clears throat> moving in the spirit is obvious in those situations. Uh, you have to, I think you have to look harder, the bigger it gets <laughs> because People get lost in the shuffle. You don't see people for who they are maybe as easily as you would in a smaller group. Uh, but 
but you know that's that's part of you know what what Taj was doing, and so it's hard for us to scale that one direction or the other. And and I can see your point. Uh, I will say this though: I think the people who fit these attributes that have these qualities, they are impacting the lives of people around them. And so there is a group, no matter how big the church is, that's being touched by these these people and are responding to those people. And they will, they'll be identified in the process, you know, uh, to that extent. Uh, but this is, go ahead. No, let me just, let me, you know, we can, we can think too hard. I spent my career in with a whole bunch of academicians who could think way too hard about certain topics and you could talk it to death and analyze it to death and get around to doing nothing. But if this wasn't important, it wouldn't be in two chapters. And it wouldn't be something that we go over all the all the time when we get to this point. So, I mean, we got a recipe. We want to fine tune the recipe a little bit, but but why do we have to be really too innovative and creative here? We, we've got some standards that have stood a, a, a very long time, and I think they've stood because God wanted them to be available to us. They really hadn't changed like he hadn't changed. Those characteristics are, are just a good, solid people, and I'd respectfully submit those ought to be characteristics we all subscribe to, whether or not we're going to be in a leadership position or not. Those are just standards of a good person. Absolutely. In fact, when we get over to chapter two, when he talks about the older, the older men talking to the younger men and the older women talking to the younger women, the attributes that he lays out that they should be sharing with them mirror these. I mean, look, really what we're seeing here is, is, is a no, I, I hate to use the word, but a mature, I'll use the word mature instead, a mature Christian. It's somebody who is, these are attributes of a Christian and, and or attributes we should all have as Christians. And as we j- go further in our journey, um, in our maturity, we're going to have more of these attributes in, in higher quality. But, but, you know, let's be honest, on this list, you could have somebody who, has struggled with these things historically and, and is only now getting to the point where uh, maybe these, you know, this problem doesn't run them, they run the problem, you know, and they've, they've just only recently gotten to the point where they've gotten uh, those issues managed on some level. Not to that they're perfect, but that they've got uh, some semblance of, of direction in regards to those things. I mean, how many, how many young men are quick tempered? You know, that's a, lots of times you see that as something that happens as people mellow out as they get older. Not always. Now, again, I know plenty of old people that are angry and, and quick to temper, but, but it's an attribute of the young, you know, that you're impulsive, that you, you respond. And as you got older, uh, maybe that becomes less of a problem. But if we were going to uh, determine whether or not somebody should be an elder and then use the fact that uh, they got in a lot of fist fights when they were 20, that would seem patently unfair, right? I mean, that would seem improper to, to measure somebody against these qualities over the entire length of their life as opposed to where they are right now. You guys agree, disagree? I think it's it's very hard to walk in somebody else's path unless you've been there. So to, to arrive at these goals allows you to have some understanding of those that are struggling with those goals. If, if you don't know what that problem is, if you've never been broke, you've never been hungry, you've never been unemployed, you don't know what it's like to be there. So I, I would say your assessment of a maturing towards, because whoever's gonna, nobody's going to attain this stuff completely. But, but going from less to becoming more, that's a sign of growth and development and a worthy attribution for any of us. And that was Terry's point earlier. Uh, I mean, that was 100% his point, uh, is that if you've never struggled with these things, how can you help people who are struggling with these things? Uh, and, and I think it's important that, uh, that whoever is, becomes an elder is able to recognize their own shortcomings in that regard and, and use that as a strength and not as a weakness necessarily. Terry? Yeah, as, as you're talking, um, the elder part 
you know, I, I think what I'm hearing is that you're you're referring to uh, lots of maturity age-wise, and yet Titus is probably not very old at this time. Y'all can correct me on that, but he is a leader who is assigned to lead the church in this function. He's not given the title of elder, but he is definitely a, a leader. And at a younger age than, than what we may be alluding to is, so age is not it. The quality of age, yeah, I know there's gonna be some qualifiers that say that, uh, that he has believing children. That's, that's gonna be a qualifier, not a quality. So the quality is not necessarily one, in my opinion, this, this governed by age or the qualities or could be a, a younger man that is recognized as having those qualities that you desire that may not be prone towards violence or anger or drunkenness or uh, is a lover of, of God and a lover of other people. That's the qualities that you're seeking. And probably if he's a lover and understanding other people, then he goes towards what Johnny is saying. He's whether he is uh, whether he's been in poverty himself. He is sensitive to people that are because you don't have to go through whatever everybody goes through. You have to you have to have a heart for what they're going going through. Yeah, and and uh, you know I. Let me say this in regards to the maturity thing. Maturity is not a one for one with age, obviously. Uh, I agree 100% with what you're saying. People mature at different rates. And uh, that's true of Christians. That's true of, of people just in general. I do think, I do sometimes think there is a correlation between age and maturity, but it's not, it's not, uh, one isn't necessary for the other and vice versa. So I, I agree with what you're saying generally. I'm just, I also do believe that there is something to be said for age and, and perspective that comes with age a lot of times that can increase wisdom, if not maturity, at least. Uh, but, but that's a personal bias on my part. And I, again, I, I will tell you that, you know, in my past experience, I have, I have voted for elders that had kids at home, you know, it, <laughs> uh, because I thought they had the qualities to be an elder. And, and, it, you know, the age, I don't think age was necessarily a disqualifier. And, and that was, that's Jason's personal perspective, but that's, that's the way I look at that. Hey, I want to hit this real quick. I do want to run through this list and talk about what each of these kind of mean to us individually, because I, I do think it's, it's important for the church as a whole to kind of get different perspectives on some of these things. And I want to make this quick. So I don't want it to be something that you linger on too long. But if we look at these, uh, depending on which translation you use, I think it's interesting that he starts off with an elder must be blameless. He actually uses that word twice. Uh, and that suggests to me that that is an overarching principle, that that is maybe like a foundational thing for an elder to be blameless. When we say an elder is to be blameless, what does what does that mean? Does anybody want to take a run at what that means to them? I'll go first on some of these, but I'm going to give you guys the chance to go first too, because Jason tends to say things too emphatically, and then people don't want to talk. Well, it's it's kind of like that that preacher story I told a few minutes ago. It's it's you know what what do the what do the you know not only the people within the congregation, but people outside of it that maybe do business with them or whatever say about them. If you're a, if you are a, you know, if, if you're a, a well-known person to cheat on deals or to Welsh on deals or whatever, uh, you're not above reproach. You are reproachful. I mean, you're, 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 you're not, you're not who you say you are. And so to me, that's, you know, that's kind of where it comes in is, uh, you know, what do people say about you at your funeral? Like, in that, uh, who's he talking about? Uh, those are, you know, those are uh, ways to look at it. 
But to me, that's to me. If, if you if you're not above reproach everywhere you are, uh, you know, with your your inside the church, outside the church, with your family, uh, you're you're putting on a false front. Yeah, you know, I think it's I think it's very much a person who's not uh, driven by their prejudice, their bias, their um, uh, you know, their the, this is kind of the catch-all good quality. You know, but when we say that, it diminishes it somewhat because we we tend to uh, equate good with nice, and I don't think that's necessarily true. I think this is a person who is is uh, not is not guided by their lower and baser thought. Uh, it, it it comes back to all the attributes of, of loving your neighbor. I mean, if you love your neighbor as you love yourself. And you know, there's 10 commandments. The first four are about how, how you treat God. The next six are how you treat each other. If, if, you're, uh, <clears throat> if you're treating other people badly, then, then you're not loving others as you love yourself. I mean, it's just, it's, you're not there. You're, you're not in line with what God wants you to be doing. You're not in line with his spirit. And that's kind of a, to me, that's a good telltale first order item on that list if you will if, if you're if you're if you're you know bad to other people uh that's that's not who you want leading your church right right uh okay uh we're, we're running a little short on time so i'm going to kind of move through this as as we're going through i'll take this next one because nobody else likes to touch it faithful to his wife or the husband of of uh of one of one of one woman, one wife, you know, I, I will tell you, this is probably this and the next one are the ones that people like to use the most to, um, to, to wrestle somebody off of their pedestal, so to speak, and, and try to diminish them in the, the process. I will tell you flat out that I do not believe, uh, that because that this scripture means if you've been divorced at any point in your life that you're eliminated from consideration. I don't believe that's what it means. Some people would have make that argument. I don't think contextually there's anything to suggest that's the case. Uh, I do I do believe uh, that one makes the argument that that it could very well mean somebody who's not a womanizer, somebody who's not uh, has doesn't have a wandering eye, is not uh, uh, pulled into uh, questionable situations uh, and lets their, again, their baser desires take control. Following up with that, a man whose children believe, that's a fascinating one uh, from the standpoint that a lot of people say, well, that means they have to be children who are out of the home because when they're in the home, it's not their belief, it's their parents' belief and other people take that to mean uh, that they have to be faithful Christians as adults and, and be uh, following it perfect in every way. Again, uh, I, think it's, I think what they are indicating here is somebody who does generally manage their household well, uh, has, has uh, taken their responsibility uh, for their children, has taken the uh, leadership role in their house, and, and keeps their house in order. Uh, at the same time, I, I, again, if your child, once they're out of the home, goes a different direction, uh, there, are, there are limits to what a parent can have done in those situations. And, and I know the scriptures. I know the scriptures that talk about those things. And I, I do think that as parents, we have a responsibility for our kids, but I do not believe that this is... Uh, uh, intended to uh, eliminate somebody who has an adult child who may not be faithful. And that's Jason. So if you have editorial comments and you want to complain, come to Jason, not to anybody else. Jason will talk to you about it. And uh, he's more than happy to take, take the brunt in regards to that thing, because I know people disagree with me and that's, that's okay. That's okay. It's okay to disagree with me. But that is, that is the position Jason takes. Okay. Uh, and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. What does that mean to you guys? Uh, I'll let somebody else handle one real quick. Well, the idea of maybe being sober or, or, or grounded. 
you, yeah. you, you can go spread some wild oats maybe somewhere in the past, but by the time you get to this position of leadership, you cannot be out of control. Yeah, I almost look at it as like not being stubborn. You know, like like some people are contrarian by nature and, and they, they constantly are, uh, uh, you tell them to go right, they're going to go left because that's, that's their nature. Uh, and I don't think that's, I, I think that that's one of those things there. Um, what does it mean to be not overbearing? I definitely don't need to, this is one of those qualities that I, I have in less uh, quality. What does it mean to be not overbearing? Anybody want to hazard that one? I would say it means being humble, uh, being a listener, letting somebody else talk. <laughs> Okay, quit throwing stones. I'm telling you. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, uh, I, th I think you're right. I, I think it's right. Uh, it is somebody who allows other people to fill the empty spaces, you know, it allows them to speak into the silence, and they're not always the one doing that. Um, and, and when other people speak into that silence, they're also hearing it and, and giving that person. Uh, recognition and, and considering the things they say without just immediately dismissing it because it's now their turn to talk. Uh, yeah, no, I think you, I think you did a good job on that one. Uh, not quick tempered. I think that's self-explanatory. You know, you don't Jason, fly off the handle. Jason, can I make one, you, the, the, yeah. you have the, the over, the overbearing one uh, a second ago. Uh, I, I think, what comes to my mind is, is if, uh, you know, like a micromanager, if, if you're going to, you know, be in absolute control of every little detail, you know, you're, you're taking away people's opportunity to grow. You're taking their away their oppor opportunity to become, uh, you know, the next level of what God wants them to be because you're, you're micromanaging them. Uh, you know, to me, it's, it's you know, more you set expectations, you remove barriers, and you hold people accountable. Uh, and if they need a little help along the way, help them, but then get out of their way. Uh, but that's how I, I look at it. I don't, you know, to me, overbearing is, is you're, you're just trying to control everything. Right. Yeah, and, and uh, the, the reality is, it, it ties back into that humility idea that we've talked about several times. You have to be willing to recognize uh, in your imperfections that, that there are others that have value and they add value to the conversation. And it can be a challenge sometimes. Uh, you know, I'm one of those people that uh, if I see the right answer or I see a solution, my answer is, my thought always is, why aren't we doing that? <laughs> and, and there is a, a, a very problem-solving attitude. And you have to be able to step back and recognize that and allow, allow the process to play out. Um, and and uh, I think that's an attribute of an elder. Uh, we, we are actually out of town, time. Uh, I, went, I let it go on longer even than I should. Uh, and I'm... I'm I'm, I'm sorry, we're not getting through all these, uh, but it's an important topic. And, and let me say this in conclusion. I know on some level, we're just talking right now about these attributes and we're just sharing ideas about what these things mean. But there are, are, are Christians out there who want to hear Paul's perspective or they want to hear Terry's perspective or Lucretia's perspective, or they want to hear Johnny's perspective. They want to hear uh, the thoughts of people who have, who have given thought to what these things are and have lived a life and have, have experienced elder selection processes over and over and again, and can, can speak from real world experience on what these things mean. So uh, look, we could break down the Greek. We could, you know, look at what all these words mean and, and have that type of discussion about it. But the reality is, especially with this group that's in front of me right now, 
you guys have seen this before. You have experienced this on all sorts of levels from different perspectives. You've been elders. You've, you've been people that have helped in the elder selection process. You've been people who are, who are just in the pews and growing up and experiencing it. It's, and so your perspective matters. And I think in this process, it's important that as a body, we have these discussions. And unfortunately, because we're not meeting together in a Bible class situation, we can't do it as a body at large. So essentially, you guys are, are, are those people by proxy. And so I really appreciate you being willing to share your thoughts and, and uh, share what these things mean to you in this process. Okay, 